It's incredible. I remember many years ago, I was uh, running a youth ministry down the Gold Coast and uh, we put a team together to go to Thailand. And uh, the, God just provided supernaturally for all the funds to come in. And in that process, we were all ready to go, a massive team. We had a full PA going over with us because it was back in the day when you couldn't really access a lot in, in country. We were going into all the upper regions of, uh, of Thailand. So we landed in Bangkok, flew up to Chiang Mai and went to Chiang Rai and, and all those upper region areas, places called Mae Seriang and worked in um, Karen villages and refugee camps of 20,000 people and stuff like that. We went into a high school over there. I didn't say that this morning, I said it was a school, just a high school. 6,000 kids. The, it's so big, it had its own railway station in the school. And uh, absolutely incredible. So we're flying out Friday night and Friday afternoon, I'm heading back from, from working at the church to organise everything to jump on a plane that night. I come around the corner on my motorbike and a lady was coming out of a shopping centre, didn't quite see me. And so she hit me on my motorbike on the night. I'm supposed to be going. And, uh, and then of course, when she hit me, if that wasn't bad enough, my poor bike, she panicked and instead of putting her foot on the brake, she put it on the accelerator and proceeded to run over me and the bike. Anyway, so then she eventually stopped when she landed into a whole bunch of cars. And I remember being in this moment and just a million thoughts running through my mind. First and foremost, how was my bike? Uh, that was cool. And, um, and then, and then I'm, I'm going up, I've got a whole trip. I'm leaving in literally a few hours and I'm going, should I cancel? What do we do? Do I try to get somebody else to do this? And I, I remember going through this process and I'm, I'm standing there looking at the carnage that is my bike and, and this thing. And then the ambulance turns up and uh, they wanted to look at me and I said, no, the poor lady's in shock. So she's in there, she's on the gas and they're trying to calm her down. And I thought, you know, I've got a decision to make in this moment and I'm standing there and I got a revelation about standing. And it wasn't that long and I thought, here's a lady in the back of an ambulance while I'm on board a plane to another country. And uh, it was all good, it's Thailand. You can access a lot of help over there in the pharmaceutical industry. And so I had a couple of uh, cracked ribs and I had done this shoulder that time and broken some bones in my foot, but we preached the Gospel and it was good. What are you gonna do in those moments when it's so easy to quit, but you really believe God is calling you to stay and stand in the process? And, and, and maybe you've gone through times like that, that sometimes these different seasons that we go through in life. And maybe you've been like that at sometimes, broken bones, but still standing. Uh, I remember when I was really young, I broke one of my ankles, actually blew it to pieces um, playing uh, AFL. I probably shouldn't have been playing AFL, should have been playing rugby. Anyway, I went up in the ruck and I landed awkwardly on my ankle and broke it. And then another guy landed on my ankle from being in the air and just blew it apart. I tried to keep playing for a little while as my foot began to fill my shoe quite convincingly. Then they finally pulled me off the field when I, when I was trying to hop after the ball. <laughs> Didn't quite work out how I was gonna kick it. And then they had to cut my shoe off, that was depressing. Uh, you know, broken dreams, perhaps you've been struggling with those things and, and, and maybe struggling to pay the bills uh, during your lifetime. And maybe, you know, you've been hurt by people inside of the church. Maybe you've been hurt by family. Maybe you've been betrayed by somebody. And here you are today. I've got amazing news. Maybe you didn't even think about this about yourself. Here you are. Congratulations. You're still standing. You're still, st have you ever thought about that? That literally at that moment when you get up and you go, I'm gonna continue, I'm gonna go back to church. And you may even hate most of the people in the church. I know I had a pastor come to me one time and telling me a story about somebody who hated them in the church. And they said, bless God, I was here before you and I'll be here after you. <laughs> and I just thought, but at least they're still standing. You know, and that reality is no matter what life throws at you, to see that you're here today and still standing, you ought to, Go, hey, I just got to remind myself I'm still standing. Hey, self, I'm still standing. Hey, devil, I'm still standing. Hey, people, I'm still standing. That God is not finished with me yet and, and I'm going to stay this process. I want you to know that, that five years from now, I want to be the kind of guy who's still standing in my faith. You ever seen some people start so strong in their walk with God? And then, you know, they're, they're, they're just off like a bullet out of a gun and they're in everything. And then five years later, you don't know where they are. They've slipped away. Be the kind of Christian that doesn't leave a question mark, but an exclamation mark. 
Be the kind of Christian that stands out for all the right reasons. Be that person who is faithful and consistent in your walk with God, that people can count on you. And, and you know, maybe there are times when that light at the end of the tunnel, when you're going through that situation, it turns out to be a train. <laughs> be the kind of person that stands anyway. There's a couple of Scriptures I want to just base from today. And uh, two of my favourite Scriptures actually. In Jeremiah 29 verse 11, you know it, you probably heard it before. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then in Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I got a question. What happens between Jeremiah 29 and Revelation 21? What happens between the word from God and the fulfillment? Between the petition and the answer, between the, the vision and the manifestation? What happens between the prayer and the promise? That's the challenge that we have, that we know God's thoughts towards us and we know the end of it. But in, the, in this middle thing, this gap that we find ourselves in so many times, when you prayed and you poured your heart out on Sunday and Monday comes and everything is exactly the same. What happens in that moment? Do you just forget about it? Move on like nothing happens? Do you get angry with God? I put my $20 worth of prayer in, Lord. I didn't get my answer. Do you get angry at people? Who let you down? People let you down. Just in case you haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> they'll let you down. Do you, do you give up on the prayer? Do you get discouraged and allow that to grow on the inside of you and turn into a root of bitterness and steal the joy from your life? In that moment, what do you do in that gap? And, and often we try to get out of it as quick as we can, but I need you to know something really important today. If you haven't already figured it out, there's always a gap. There's always a gap between the prayer and the promise. There's always a gap between the seed and the harvest. There's always a gap between the believing and the manifestation for that which you're believing for. And often what happens in that gap is the very thing that builds us into who God wants us to be. And how you handle this and what you do in this place will determine the depth and the quality of your Christian faith. The seed was sowed, do you remember the story? And it fell on the shallow ground and they shot up and produced fruit and they looked great and fantastic. But when the pressure of the world came, they hadn't had the roots. Others, when the weeds grew up around them and the distractions of life began to steal them away from the things of God and they, they, they were unable to keep free from that and they were no longer able to produce the good fruit. There's gotta be that, that testing time in your life that you allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. And that is the very thing that we sometimes try to run from and try to get away from, but it's the very thing that makes us who God has called us to be. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, in the Passion, it says, Don't allow your hearts to grow dull or lose your enthusiasm, but follow the example of those who fully received what God has promised because of two things, they fully received what God has promised. It wasn't just their faith, it was their patient endurance. It wasn't just the great prayer that they prayed. It wasn't that they came to an anointed meeting. It was the fact that they stood when others didn't. It was the fact that they kept going when others quit. It's the fact that, that they were able to endure those, those things that, that others weren't able to endure. I'm never forget many years ago, I was doing a run and I'm running up this hill and I was trying to follow somebody. I don't know if you've ever run. And uh, one of the things you do is, you know, you, you don't have to try to be the first person. You just beat that person in front of you. And then they're like, I'm winning, yay. Anyway, I'm running up this hill and I'm, I'm nearly done. I can't do it anymore, right? I am spent, I'm had it. I'm gonna spew up, there's no more, this is it. I can't do it, Lord. And then he stopped. So I run past him, how you going? Suddenly it was like a magic formula. And then I had my next person. Because why? Because something on the inside of us began to grow. That process made me realise I had more in me. I had more to give. And, and so many times in our lives when we think we're at the end of our rope and we go, just tie a knot in it and hang on. God goes, no, let go and trust me. <laughs> that moment where we just go, I'm just gonna keep standing in that moment. Because we share a lot about the promises of God. We talk a lot about the blessing of God and the favour of God. And, and we talk about, you know, uh, 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 how God is just gonna make everything wonderful and you're gonna wake up to angels singing. 
And if you're not living in that season, you can feel like you're doing something wrong. But the reality is we never stay in that season. I don't know if you've realised it, but life is seasonal. And all of those seasons, God uses to build something on the inside of us. And maybe you're exactly where God wants you to be today. Have you ever thought that maybe this is perhaps the pathway to your promise? That the very first thing, when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, you know the story, He comes down to get baptised by John the Baptist and everybody's kind of freaking out. And John's like, I shouldn't be baptised in you, this is weird. And then God speaks in an audible voice and said, behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the very next thing with the endorsement of God and the recognition of man and the fulfilment of a promise, Jesus then walks out and walks into eternal glory and starts raising dead people and builds an amazing church. That's not what happened. Do you know what happened? Do you know what the Holy Spirit did? You know the story, right? The Holy Spirit comes after He's just been been confirmed in conditions and then He leads Him into the wilderness. It was the will of God. It wasn't the devil who led him to the wilderness. It was the Spirit of God because he needed to build something in him to show us a process that we go through, to show us that wherever life has brought us to this place, it's okay. He is our ever present help in time of need. Why does the Bible say that? Because there's times of need when we need Him to be present and help. So this morning, I, I, uh, I got inspired by Stephen Furtick. Anybody heard of that guy? And uh, Stephen Furtick, he always writes little clever little things and matches it all up. Don't judge me, just blame him. This is his inspiration, but I wrote it. Be, be impressed even if you're not, okay? Just clap and go, that was amazing because of my poor insecurity. <laughs> this present persecution perhaps has the potential to produce promotion, providing you the power to pursue the promised purpose of God's perfection in you as a person, not a prison, more like a platform to propel people from predicament and perceived punishment to producing pertinacious power. Still standing, <laughs> amen, still standing. <laughs> I'd like to say I pray that over myself every morning, but I can't remember it. There's something powerful about being that last person standing. You know, just to go, there's something about it that you say, I refuse to quit. I don't know whether it's I'm stupid or stubborn, but I'm still gonna keep standing for the promises of God. And uh, we've got to have that kind of faith if we're gonna really make an impact, a lasting impact in our generations. And so today, before we finish up, I just wanna be able to give you uh, uh, five quick points that we can go through that is gonna help equip you in the process of standing. Because some of you, need this right now. And all of you will need this at some point because your faith will be shaken because that's what happens to faith. It gets shaken to make sure it's not in a process, but in a person of Jesus Christ. Their doubts will always come. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the presence of Jesus in a situation. And when you've got Him, even when the doubts come, you still stand and you believe. Even when everybody else begins to betray the process, you stand because you go, I'm trusting Him. I'm trusting Him and my eyes are on my Lord. So five quick things today for the note takers just to make you feel like you got your money's worth. First key, if you wanna stay standing is submit. Yeah, that's what happens when I say that word. Nobody kind of gets excited about that cool word. It's really, it's not the word you can walk around with submit on your T-shirt and people go, wow, that's cool. I like that, submit, cool, yeah. I really don't like the word submit so much and, and yet it's something that God has called us to do. In James chapter four, verse seven, it writes, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's a process here. Before you resist the devil, you need to submit to God. And so many times we try to resist the devil, but we're not submitting to God. And so we walk out. You know what happens when you do that? You're out from your covering. 1 Peter 5, 5 takes it even further, this whole point of submission and says, submit to your elders, submit to your leaders and even submit to each other. You know, we're, we're, all the guys love wives submit to your husbands. Isn't that cool? It's really cool until you read it in context because then it says submit to one another. And it does say wives submit to your husbands, but then it goes on straight away and says, husbands die for your wives. Well, that's not right. <laughs> Because husband is the head of the wife. That word head is a terrible translation. Do you know the other word that is actually the word that we use? Wives, you can submit to your husband. That's wonderful. Husbands, you are responsible. 
So you better learn to submit one to another because I'm gonna hold you responsible, not your spouse. Oh, that's good preaching for somebody. This freedom in submission, when you place yourself into a place of submission, there is a freedom because you're not operating out of your authority. You're operating out of the authority of your Father. And so you find yourself in a situation at work where you're struggling with your boss and you just wanna quit. Can I encourage you to submit? When you find yourself involved in a leadership position in the church and somebody's got a different opinion to you, then can I encourage you in that place to submit? Yeah, but they're wrong. Who cares? I care. I hate it. I jump up and down. I yell. I bang the walls. I send emails to anonymous people. Tell them exactly how I feel. I email myself, you dirty dog. (laughs) And then I submit because God is wanting to build something in the process. And I don't mean submit to something that is illegal or unethical, but most of the time it doesn't. You know what? It just crosses our personal values, our preferences and our perceptions. And we make a big song and dance and we're prepared to die on a hill that nobody else is fighting on. The futility of fighting for a cause that Jesus didn't die for will leave you empty at the end of it and the process are less of a person than what God is trying to build in you. He builds you in the place of submission. Submit to the call of God right where you are right now. Submit to the process of the call. When He calls you into the blessing and the favour of God, remember, like I said with Jesus, He didn't call you to do and be an amazing person without going through the process. Submit. Be found faithful even when it's hard. Number two, stay, stay. When Jesus anointed everybody and prayed for them and died for them, He said, go into the world and preach the Gospel. But before any of that happened, when He died, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, He said, stay. He said, being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, you've heard from me. That ability to stay in that job, That ability to stay in the church. Well, I don't really agree with them. Well, that's all right. We didn't really agree with you. I don't really like them. Well, we didn't like you either, but you know, kind of stuck with your family. (laughs) You know, I've been been believing for my no good husband for 20 years. He ain't saved. Stay. Maybe in the 21st year, he gets saved. If If he's not stopping you following Jesus Christ, if you're in a safe environment, stay. Stay at that, stay at that place. Don't don't jump the boat. Don't try to get ahead of the process. Don't try to produce your own pathway. What was the last thing that God told you to do? Just do it. If you haven't got that answer, if you haven't received the breakthrough moment, then then just stay in the process. You don't need to manufacture it. God doesn't need your help. He's got it under control. I remember at the end of 2010, um, Jenny and I felt a real stirring in our heart that there's a change of season coming. And uh, in our lives. And so we're praying about this and kind of like, I don't know what that means. And at that point, we had so many offers come in. You wouldn't believe it. And you know what I've learned? That always happens. Always happens. You could do this and you could do that. You could do this. And and, and I just really felt by God to stay in the process that God wanted me to do. And so we stayed. And I'll never forget the day Pastor Mark came down to my office and he walked into my office and he sat down on the chair and I freaked out. Because first off, he'd never been in my office and he'd never sat on my chair. And so I thought, I'm being fired. I don't know what I'm being fired for, but obviously it's something. Maybe he didn't like the last present I bought him. What's wrong with the blood pressure kit? That's very practical. (laughs) No, I didn't, I'm joking. But God called us then and uh, we we were sent out to City Point North, which was amazing. Since that time in 2011, when we went across to right now, all those years ago, I think about that. What would have happened if we'd stepped out on our own? I can tell you exactly. We'd be on our own. That's what happens when you don't stay. You are on your own. But here we were, we were sent, we were covered, we're still together, we're still supported, we're still believed in, we're still growing, we're still being prayed for and we're still being paid for. And we're still standing, amen, building a great church that's continuing to grow, raising up leaders, changing a generation, and now saving up to buy our own building, which is awesome. Love it. Just stay in the process. That leads to number three, because to stay, you've got to surrender. Galatians 2 verse 20 in a translation that I don't even know. 
but I liked it. It's called The Voice. I've never heard of it before. It says, I've been crucified with the anointed one. I'm no longer alive, but the anointed is living in me. And whatever life I have left in this failing body, I live by the faithfulness of God's Son. The one who loves me gave his body on the cross for me. Job declared these words, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Jarius said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mary said, how can this be, Lord? For I am still a virgin, but nevertheless, at your word. This place of surrendering to the process and the call of God, a place of surrender that God calls us. And and we've got to have that journey on the inside of us that if we want to ever make, make it to the great things that God has called us to, then it always starts with the humbling things that He takes us through. That if you want to be taller in the kingdom, then you need to spend more time on your knees. That the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. East Stanley Joan writes it this way, if you don't surrender to Christ, you surrender to chaos. Surrendering doesn't mean giving in in the kingdom. Surrendering means giving up to the King. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Lift up your eyes. Jesus is in the garden and He said these words to the Father when He was all alone and nobody was with Him. He said, Lord, if there's any other way, But then at that moment of surrender, the miracle moment was not at the cross, people. It was in the garden when He said, not my will, but yours be done. I would rather be found faithful serving in the house than standing in the courts of kings. I would rather be found faithful greeting people at the door as an usher than lead a big organisation that He hasn't called me to. I would rather not be a great evangelist if He's called me to work in the cafe. A greatness in the Kingdom of God is never about prominence. It's always about significance. And significance is different to what you think. It's not significance to the cause, it's significance to the call. What has God called you to do? When He comes, will you be found faithful? when I stand before Him one day, I really just wanna hear a couple of words. I don't wanna talk too much because He freaks me out, He's God. But I really wanna hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. And I go, thank goodness, because I'm really tired. No, I'll be a blubbering mess. Don't laugh, you will be too. Number four, settled. I gotta pick this up. Number four is settled, settled. Galatians 3, 6, Abraham, was the father of faith because he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's that old saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Don't doubt in the darkness what was clear in the light. James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man expect anything from God. So he calls us to settle some things. We wanna see the promise, but sometimes when we go through the process, we come unstuck because we haven't settled some things that we need to settle. See, if you don't really realise that God is for you, then you'll always wonder if He is or isn't. If you don't realise that God wants to bless you, then you'll always struggle with generosity because you'll think you're giving over your money. I'm releasing my money. I whisper quietly to the 50s and the hundreds. I don't bother talking to the fives. I just whisper them, go, find your freedom. Tell your friends to come back to me. Because I know that God wants to be blessed. I want to encourage my finances to remember that. I'm so committed that that God wants to bless my life that no matter what the report of the doctor says, I know that His will will be done in my life. So I'm believing for healing. Because when I pray, I can pray in faith and believe that. I am so confident. There are some things that I've settled. I've settled that me and my family will serve the Lord. If my children don't serve the Lord, I will beat them to death. And on their deathbed, they will serve the Lord. Then they will see Jesus. There's no question mark over their parents' faith. Where are we found on Sunday? We're found in the house of God. That's because you're the pastor. I'm a pastor because I was found in the house. That's the reason. See, the, 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 the position came long after the process was sorted. You ought to be a question mark, sorry, an exclamation mark rather than a question mark. When people go, they ought to know where you stand and what you think in life situations. There ought to be some settled things in your life. And here's the the kicker in this. Settled doesn't mean sorted. 
There are some things that are settled, but I know they're not sorted. Because you, like me, we're a work in progress. Isn't that true? We got to settle some things and then we just sort through it. I know I'm supposed to love my husband, but I'm waiting for him to go to sleep so I can stab him. (laughs) It's settled, but not sorted. (laughs) So you maybe pray through it that afternoon and give him some space and encourage him not to come home for a while. (laughs) Sort of, maybe you got some teenagers like that. It's settled, we love you. We want the best for you, but it's not sorted. We want to put you in a children's home. (laughs) It's not sorted, it's a process, you know? But we gotta go through that. We gotta settle these issues. And finally, as the band comes, we wanna talk about standing. We gotta learn how to stand. And a great verse, one of my favourites in Ephesians chapter six, it says these words, therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. This moment when you choose to stand, no matter what's going on, when the devil has got into a relationship, just continue to stand. When he's in the process of trying to destroy your marriage, just continue to stand. Maybe maybe you've gone through one marriage, two marriages, three marriages. I did one not that long back and I'll never forget, he was on his fourth marriage and she was on her third. So I'm counselling them before and I said, I said to them, statistically, you won't make it past the honeymoon. Here they are today still standing. That, that even though they've got all that track record, you know what they did from that? They used it to build their future on. And it didn't become a stumbling block, but rather a stepping stone. And sometimes we allow our failures to define us, but our failures are not final. And they, 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 if we grab them the right way, we can stand even and miss it. It doesn't, you could fall and you could try to fall. Let me tell you, you are not that powerful to take yourself out of the will and the purposes of God. His grace is sufficient. You didn't do it to earn it, so you can't lose it through doing something that, that you mess up in. When the moment you begin to step up and stand for the things of God is the moment His will begins to get activated in your life again. Maybe you fought for so long, you've taken so many hits, you've had so many moments of struggle. I want you this morning as we close to, to take courage from the words of the founder of the Foursquare Church, Amy Semple McPherson. Maybe you've never heard of her. I love her, she's great. She was such a firebrand. She wrote a lot of poems and in one of the poems she has these lines and it says this, Strong is the foe that advances and snapped is my blade, O Lord. See their proud banners and lances, but spare me the stub of a sword. I will stand.